I've really enjoyed the panel and all of the um, discussion. I think that uh, by listening to everyone today that we can truly say that African Americans are not monolithic in their opinions, because uh, so many varying and different opinions today about this subject matter. In fact, when I knew that we were going to have this discussion, I did talk a lot about race in the newsroom and had quite a bit of discussion. I, there was one young man who I think raised his hand and said, what can we do? And um, my advice would be talk. It's always good to talk. So let's begin this journey through the impact of social injustice on the minority psych. Because I'm over 50. Yes, I'm going to go ahead and admit that. That's the reason why I wear the readers. I'm going to give in to that. You know, the attitude of black America, some of us anyway, because I can't speak for everyone, no matter how many people come up to me and say, what does black America feel about this? The attitude of some of us in black America regarding social injustice is shaped in part, in my opinion, by four things, history, environment, personal experience, and perception. So allow me to share some of my first experiences in meeting a police officer at the tender age of six years old. Now, I was a bit of a comedian, or so I thought, at six years old. I was walking through my neighborhood, and I yelled out what I thought was a joke to a passing patrol car. I said, hey, officer, what's black and white with a cherry on top with two nuts inside? Well, the officer stopped the car abruptly, walked over to me, stood over to me, stood over me and said, I could haul you off to jail. I could haul you off to jail right now, you little brat. Now, you know, he could have taken a different tone. He could have approached me and made it a teaching moment. He could have made that experience of coming up to this child and just simply having a conversation. But that was my first experience. Now, when I told my mother what happened, she sat me down and had the talk. And many women who, many African American women know the idea of having the talk. Some black women in America routinely sit down and talk to their children as a safety measure. They talk to children of color to be extra cautious in the way that they interact with law enforcement because it could mean the difference between life and death. Now, I have quite a few diverse friends, lots of them, in fact. And not one of my white friends has instructed me or told me that this is the way they've been instructed while growing up with their parents, not one. Five years ago, I was riding in a car with my husband, driving the speed limit because I'm a bit of a nag. My adult son was in the back seat, and we were pulled over in Portsmouth on the Western Freeway. My husband respectfully asked why we were stopped. The officer said that we were speeding. I leaned over and said, officer, I was monitoring my husband's speed, and in fact, he was on cruise control. I believe that the officer recognized me and recognized my voice. Can I be sure? No. His response was, oh, I don't have time for this. I was on my way to a rape. Just slow down. Now, seriously. If you're on your way responding to a rape, do you stop what you think is a speeding car? Were we profiled, perception, or reality? I polled a small sample of some of my black friends for this speech between the ages of 35 and 54. Every single one believed they had at one point in their lives been profiled either in a store or driving in a car. So if the question of this meeting is, how does that shape the attitudes of some black Americans? Of the small sample of people I interviewed, they said they are often suspicious of the motives of people who they feel treat them differently. 
when they don't get the job that they know that they're uniquely qualified for, if they don't get the house that they know that they can afford, if they don't get the promotion, some of us wonder, could it be because of the bias of the person making the decision? Is it a perception or is it reality? That is the question that some people ask and that might be the impact of social injustice on the minority psych. Now, the FBI director, James Comey, recently said something very bold. He delivered an unusually candid speech on racial bias, citing the song, Everyone's a Little Bit Racist, from the Broadway show Avenue Q. He said police officers of all races viewed black and white men differently. Mr. Comey said there was significant research showing that all people have unconscious racial biases. Law enforcement officers, he said, need to design systems and processes to overcome that very human part of us all. He went on to say, although the research may be unsettling, what we do next is what matters most. Now, Let's tackle what we talked about earlier. Perception in media is another landscape to tackle. As managing editor in a newsroom, it is a moving target on a daily basis. Blacks in the newsroom must raise their voices to knock down negative images on a daily basis. And I'll give you an example. A young producer wrote a copy story on a crime story. And you know we write crime stories every day. She wrote a crime story and wrote the words. Norfolk police are looking for a black male, six foot two, 180 pounds. And I told her, that story can't run in our show. She said, why not? I said, read it out loud. She said, okay, okay. Norfolk police are looking for a black male, six foot two, 180 pounds. I said, so am I. Okay, so it could be anybody. I was trying to convey the idea that you can't put vague descriptions out there into the atmosphere and not expect it to contribute to bias. It will reinforce the bias, fear of the black man if it's so generic. That's what we're trying to do on a daily basis in the newsroom. That's the reason why we remove race in some cases if we don't have a good description. So you will find sometimes, and we will have people actually call the newsroom, why didn't you put race in there? You just put nothing. Well, that's because we don't have enough to go on. That's why. Martin Luther King Jr. dreamed of the day when his children would be judged by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. And I have friends who say they wish for a colorblind society. I know you touched on this earlier. I say the human condition of bias makes both of these goals difficult, if not impossible, based on our social and political environment. I agree with the dream, but I object to the idea of a colorblind society. By definition, to be colorblind in this context is to not accept diversity. We should embrace our differences, celebrate our shades, and our backgrounds. Some critics say mainstream society embraces black culture but rejects black people. We see that in music, we see that in fashion, we see that in entertainment and sports. In Japan, they just selected a new Miss Japan who happens to be biracial and they're rejecting her because they say that she is not suitable because she's not Japanese enough. Globally, we need to approach this whole idea of bias. Okay, how does that impact us as a people when our culture is embraced but we are still in large part rejected on other landscapes? Well, I sampled on Facebook to see how some whites respond, some, some, respond when blacks post what they see as an injustice. In a recent NPR report, 
A black woman and her white friend, who happened to be a police officer, reviewed the video of an unarmed black man in Staten Island who was placed in a chokehold by an officer and died. They both saw the same event very differently. The black woman didn't see resistance, and the white officer did. When I sampled feedback of that posting on Facebook, the same response split mostly, not all, but mostly along racial lines. Mostly, white comments labeled the black posting as, quote, angry, paranoid, overly sensitive, do as you're told and you won't have trouble, chips on your shoulders, playing the race card. Not all white people think that way, and not all black people agree that recent police conflicts are based on race. But the question that grows louder is, are black concerns over racial social injustice not validated by society? While the impact on the minority psyche cannot be painted with a general brush, as we have had many different experiences in a variety of environments, as long as the data supports the idea of bias as a fact, to paraphrase Joseph Heller in Catch-22, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. When people ask if old-fashioned racism is alive and well in this country, I cite a recent example that answers in part. The nation collectively gasped when the happy-go-lucky bigotry of Sigma Alpha Epsilon frat brothers were captured on video singing about hanging the N-word from a tree, watching 20-year-olds talk about lynching, erase the idea for a moment in my mind that racism would die out with the older generation. Yet, there is another image that gave us hope. Speaking at the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March, President Barack Obama said this, we just need to open our eyes and our hearts to know that this nation's racial history still casts its long shadow upon us. Listen with pride to the stirring words of the first black president, but also listen to the frat boys on the bus. I'm gonna leave you with this because my grandmother used to tell stories. That was her way of making sure that the history was passed down, the history of lessons. She said, Barbara, children are like lumps of clay. Everyone who touches the child leaves an impression. I just invite you to make sure that you are touched with positive and peaceful impressions as you go through your life. But I will also ask you to reach out to your family members to get that positive feedback when you meet with negative things that happen in your life. As a young reporter, I was sent out to cover a story that was quite odd for me. I was 19 and there was a man on the outskirts of Tucson, Arizona that was having a rally because he didn't want women or black people in the fire department, so guess who they sent? Well, off I went, and so I stuck the microphone in his face and I said, okay, chief, what's the problem in here? And he said, no problem, Barbara, I just don't want the women and the Negroes in here, that's all. Well, my stomach kind of went up and down and filed the story, went home, talked to my grandmother and I said, what's the lesson here? I'll leave you with what she told me because I carry it with me every day. She said, the lesson is, don't let hate make you hateful. Thank you very much.